this is the book, Conspiracy of Fools. Um, it's going to be sold at our special price. It will be autographed, and you shouldn't leave without a copy. The book has had a phenomenal run. And the New York Times, two in two successive Sunday editions, led their business section with excerpts from this book. Um, since the New York Times has been a big part of my life for a long time, I, I said this is unusual to say the least, and it is. Unprecedented, really, but it's because of the importance of the book and the need for all of us to understand how this story, the Enron story, developed and what can we do to ensure that stories like this never occur again. The gentleman who is our guest who wrote this book is one of the most highly regarded and accomplished reporters in our country. You do not get hired at the New York Times without great skill. And for, he's had a long run. And he's valued highly in the councils of, of the world's greatest newspaper. So it's an honor and a privilege to have him. And I just to remind you quickly that UCSD Television is with us, as always. We're grateful for that. So that whatever transpires here today will be made available to a much infinitely greater audience and in due course through the University of California San Diego Library. This program today will be available on the World Wide Web. Will you join with me please in welcoming a very, very gifted journalist and a wonderful guy from the New York Times, Mr. Kurt Eichenwall. Okay, now how do I live up to that? <laughs> I got to start off with one thing. I did have my one moment today where I, where I actually cracked up in a studio on the air, and it was because of you, Mr. Freeman, because they were announcing how the new Petco hot dogs were available at the stadium. <laughs> and I thought they were kidding, but... <laughs> I realized I was the only one in the studio laughing, so no. So get on out there and don't think of what they're made of. The, um, tell you a little bit about my background, I'm going to tell you about the book. The, uh, I have been covering corporate fraud at the New York Times, believe it or not, as a, as a beat for coming up on 18 years. Uh, I was asked to do it, there we go, I'm much shorter than you are. I was asked uh, to do it for three months. They figured that would be you know, enough time to root out all the corporate fraud in America. <laughs> and here I am in 2005, still going, not ending. Looks like I'll keep at it for quite some time to come. And over the years, back in around 91, I had just finished writing a uh, a couple of articles about, well, a couple of years earlier, I'd written a couple of articles about a, a corrupt law firm and was going through a bookstore and I saw this book by this guy I'd never heard of before um, named John Grisham and I was flipping through it and I went, oh, hey, this is kind of like the story I was just doing. And uh, moved on from there. I was writing about uh, a corrupt insurance company and a couple of years later, was picking up a book called The Rainmaker by John Grisham about a corrupt insurance company. I was like, this is that's odd coincidence. A colleague of mine was writing about the tobacco litigation and out came the runaway jury. And I kept noticing this pattern. And um, then I saw an article where John Grisham was quoted. He says, oh yeah, I get all of my ideas out of the newspaper. And I just thought, I'm on the wrong end of this deal. <laughs> But I realized that with everything I knew about corporate fraud, with everything I knew about securities laws, with everything I knew about accounting, that John Grisham was smarter than me. That John Grisham had figured out that 
these stories that I was writing about in the newspaper were in fact contained within them the kinds of narratives that have thrilled people for centuries. They were Shakespearean, they were thrillers, they were page turners, and they involved people that were all somewhat larger than life. And I looked at that and I thought, how many people are reading John Grisham and how many people are reading me? Um, and I decided that, to be blunt, he, I was going to check down his path. He has imagination. I do not. I'm not good at imagination. What I have is the ability to dig into a story, find out what happened, and tell the real story. So at the end of the day, what I decided to do was to write corporate thrillers. That just happened to be true. Um, this is my third book. Uh, my last book, The Informant, get ready to try and stay awake as I say this, is about price fixing at a feed company. <laughs> Soon to be a major motion picture starring Matt Damon. I swear it's true. Uh, because the story, in fact, was thrilling. It's this bizarre, thrilling tale. When Enron popped up, uh, I am probably the last person in America who thought I would write a book about Enron. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'm pretty sure I am the last person in America to think I would write a book about Enron. Uh, very many people quickly decided that they wanted to write books that were, would explain what happened at Enron, would tell people, here's everything you ever want to know about Enron. And I just believed that people were going to hear everything they wanted to hear in the newspaper. I didn't think the world was going to care that much about the intricate details of what happened at Enron. And so I was approached to do books and I kept turning it down. Um, I was working on the story for three months for the New York Times and after about three months, just one day, I noticed the narrative. It just, it was like the fog had lifted. And suddenly I began to recognize this story for what it was which was an epic tale of an era of, of Shakespearean dimensions, I keep using that word, that with done correctly would be a corporate thriller. Um, I decided based on that, that I was going to do the book. I signed up the contract. It took six months of reporting until I actually did have in my head, I see where the narrative is, and then another year's worth of reporting to fill that in. Um, I say all this to explain that this is not a book that is for people who care about Enron. Those people will be interested in it. Those people will learn a lot of things they didn't know. This is a book for people who, number one, want to have a good time. It's a fun book. It's a shocking book. It's a, it's a terrifying book. Um, but it's also for people who want to understand how we got where we are today. Because Enron is not a story of a company. Enron is not the story of a, just a bunch of bad people. Enron is the story of an era. An era where in this country we collectively lost our minds. Um, you know, in 1998, I had been writing, I, I started writing about medical research a lot uh, and business involvement in medical research. And my wife said to me, you know, well, you're not really writing directly about corporate fraud anymore. And I said, well, give me three years and you won't see me anymore. Because of the market, because of the way the market was going. A rising market covers all sins. And we're now seeing how many there actually were. Um, the sins at Enron, what made this company fascinating, what made it epic, is that the company and the scandal aren't what most people think they are. The general viewpoint, and I have some people who react with great horror when I say this, the general viewpoint is that Enron is the story of a bunch of crooks. A bunch of criminals got together, decided to get themselves rich, rip off America, and who knows? I've never quite figured out what the end point of that analogy story is. Um, and truth be told, if that was the story, if this was just a story of a bunch of criminals, I wouldn't be interested in it. 
uh, criminals, after a while, criminals are kind of boring. You know, they go off, they find the money, they take it. And that's it. Enron is a much more complex story. There are crimes, there's no doubt. There's a lot of crime at Enron. Uh, there are criminals at Enron. But you could have doubled the amount of crime at Enron and this company would have survived if only you could have figured out a way to cut the incompetence in half. Enron is a story of a toxic stew, of a culture that was thriving on a fast money era where standards fell through the floor, where reality was whatever the market would price, and where doubters just didn't get it, were dismissed out of hand. And who played into that? It's like people look at the title and they have no idea what I'm talking about. Conspiracy of fools. And they say, well, are you saying that everyone at Enron was just stupid? It's like, well, yeah. <laughs> so they're not criminals? No, they're criminals too. But who, I never said I'm talking about the people at Enron. Who is the conspiracy among? Yes, the executives of Enron. Yes, it is a conspiracy of fools at Enron. Yes, the accounting firms and the bankers and the investment banks all were part of this conspiracy of fools. Criminals, some, others, fools, it all combines. But ultimately, we are the fools. We are the ones who came to believe that it made logical sense for people to become millionaires overnight. That it made logical sense that somebody who's not qualified to, to run the cash register at the Gap should be running a major American corporation worth more than General Motors because it sells dog food over the internet. We were the ones who suspended all disbelief and our analysis of corporate success was limited to one question. What's the stock price? Didn't matter how they got there. Didn't matter what they did. We didn't have to understand what they did. And trust me, nobody, nobody understood what Enron did. Because Enron didn't understand what Enron did. They had a business model that was horrifically flawed. And with it, deep within it, they had real businesses and real entities that were producing earnings, and some of them were producing cash. But surrounding that, like some sort of poisonous piece of candy with a good nugget, a nougat in the middle, um, were failed businesses, illogical businesses, irrational businesses that didn't produce cash, didn't produce earnings, were a drain on everything because these guys simply did not know how to manage a business. What they knew how to do was once they mismanaged a business to make those numbers not appear on their books. That was Enron. That was what they did. That was how they did it. The story has many major characters, but there are three I'll focus on today. Um, Ken Lay is the one everyone, everyone knows his name, the chairman and chief executive of Enron. Uh, uh, Jeff Skilling, who became Lay's successor of chief executive for about 43 seconds before he resigned. And then Andy Fastow, who's the chief financial officer. Now there are a lot of other people. Uh, there's Rick Causey, the chief accounting officer. There's Rebecca Mark, the head of the uh, international division and the water division. But if you take these people, each one of them played a particular role in the creation of this enterprise, an enterprise where people were, were rewarded richly for doing the thing that brought in earnings, reportable earnings. And we're not rewarded for saying, wait a minute, those earnings are unsustainable. Wait a minute, the accounting on that isn't right. Wait a minute, we're putting ourselves in a long-term problem. And when you have that kind of environment, when you have those kinds of people, 
you're going to have a scandal. Um, now, one thing, if um, you could let me just give me a signal when you want me to wrap it up, because unfortunately my clock has stopped showing me the time. <laughs> so, uh, the clearest criminal in the organization, and it's very simple to why I reached that conclusion, is Andy Fastow. Why well, I say he's the clearest? Because he's pled guilty. Uh, he admits his crime. He also is the one. You know, you can sort of detect that someone has committed a crime when you find millions and millions of dollars in corporate cash in their personal bank accounts that they're not supposed to have. That's what in my profession is called a clue. So, um, Andy Fastow is the fellow who actually looted Enron. He actually looted another company called NatWest, which was doing a deal with Enron, uh, and used that money for personal enrichment. He was not qualified to be the chief financial officer of Enron. He knew nothing about accounting. He was not particularly adept at the normal world of finance. What you see in the book is anytime something comes up that is the job of the chief financial officer, he just sort of sends that on somebody else's way. What he wanted to do were these big deals with the off-books partnerships and where you make the accounting come out right. Well, you make the accounting come out the way you want it to. Um, he got the job largely because of going up the line, Jeff Skilling. Jeff Skilling is the fellow who came up with the idea for Enron's wholesale gas and electricity business. Energy trading, electricity trading. Here in California, you've probably heard of that, yeah. right? The electricity trading? I think. Um, Skilling was the brain behind that. Skilling had created a successful division. What he also did, however, was supervise, at the time they called it organized chaos, I can now tell you it was not organized, uh, the chaos of Enron, where people were rewarded for telling Jeff Skilling that he was right, where people, everyone's goal was to come up with another penny or two or 10 or 20 that could be reported on the income statement. And people were moved in and out of jobs very rapidly until they were able to perform. Andy Fastow was a skilling favorite. Andy Fastow delivered. Andy Fastow took something that was normally a, a, a cost center, you know, finance, you're spending money on bringing in bankers and the rest, and turned it into a profit center. Now, as one reviewer who used to be a securities analyst said, that's a really bad sign. And it's true. When you have something that's a support business actually being a business, you've got a problem. Going up the line to the next level was Ken Lay. Um, the biggest thing I've been surprised about, because you know, like I said, I think more people read Grisham than me, uh, is I have written in the New York Times, here is what Ken Lay has been charged with. Here are the charges. And the, the first time I wrote it, the front page, the third paragraph was, the most surprising thing is what Mr. Lay has not been charged with. He has not been charged with having any involvement in the off-books partnership manipulations. He has not been charged with have, doing any illegal accounting that affected Enron's income statement. He has not been charged with hiding debt. He has not been criminally charged with insider trading. And um, the book comes out, and I've had more than a few people go, but you don't have Ken Lay doing any of those things. It's like, and, and my standard is, well, you know, if the government can't find enough to get a grand jury indictment, you can't expect I'm going to find enough to convict. Um, what you do see Ken Lay doing in this book, and where Ken Lay's exposure comes in, is in the last 12 weeks of Enron, when this company that had been considered a giant was suddenly revealed to be a pygmy. Ken Lay went out and made statements about the company's financial health. Ken Lay went out and talked to investors, to employees, to credit rating agencies, and made a series of statements about what he believed to be the financial health of the company. Now the government has charged him saying, you didn't believe that. You were lying and you knew it. Um, each one of those instances is chronicled in the book. Each one of those instances is laid out in pretty vivid detail, including some other instances that aren't 
in the uh, in the indictment. At the end, I've never written about a corporate fraud case that had so much emotion attached to it. And that's not to say I haven't written about situations where people have been, you know, where, where people have seen their life savings wiped out. I've seen that time and time again. In this one, we need for these people to be evil. They're people. They are people, some of whom committed crimes. We need for these people to be the personification of all that is wrong in the world. We need for everything we read to reinforce that viewpoint, to tell us you have every reason to be angry at them because they are bad people from start to finish. And what you get in the book is, no, these are real people. And here's where they are, and look, here's one of them committing a crime, and look, here's one of them doing something where it sure looks like a crime, and here they are doing something else that's not so bad. And some people get furious about that. And I know the reason why. If they're not the center of all evil in the universe, if in fact they are just bumbling, stumbling crooks, which quite a number of them are, then what are we? Who are we? And unfortunately, the answer is not comforting. The answer is, when we point the finger and say, you were greedy, we should be pointing the finger at ourselves. We wanted riskless wealth. We believed in riskless wealth. We believed in the new paradigm, whatever that meant. We believed that the old rules didn't apply anymore. We believed. We believed. And when people came along, including the chairman of the SEC, and said in speech after speech, the accounting rules have been undermined, the numbers being reported by American corporations are not reliable, we need to fix the conflicts in the system, this is 1998, this is being said. Did we react in horror? Did we say, oh, protect us? We said, shut up and let's party. Didn't want it to end. The problem is, you know, the emperor can only walk down the street naked so long until somebody finally says he has no clothes. The late 1990s valuations were insane. Accounting rules were abused, and we had every reason to know it, and we didn't want to see. We didn't want to see. So when the world came crashing down, we could blame ourselves. We could say it's all the fault of these criminals, and I'm not exon exonerating them here. I mean, bear in mind, I'm calling them criminals. Or we could look at it and just say, <laughs> we knew where we were going, and we got what we paid for. Enron is the ultimate company that got what it paid for. It, was, it paid employees to produce earnings. It did not pay anyone to hold down expenses. It did not pay anyone for good compliance. It didn't pay anyone for, wow, you're a really ethical employee. It was, what's your contribution for the bottom line? And we, in turn, turned around and we paid companies by driving up their stock price, not for articulating a good business strategy, not for uh, uh, showing superior management, not for creating a vehicle where you could, you could see its application in the future. We rewarded companies by, because they were able to keep their stock prices going up. You know, and that is where we are wrong. If a company misses its earnings by a penny, it doesn't mean anything. But we drive down the stock price. And then we get horrified to find out that 
before the quarter ends, companies work to make sure they don't miss their earnings by a penny. We are creating the very environment that we condemn. Okay, I'm pontificating. I'll give you that. I have seen so much fraud in my life. I have seen so many people have their lives wrecked, their careers wrecked. I have seen people tempted and they commit the crime. I see people who have been fooled, who are victims of the crime. And I hate it. I make my living off of fraud. And I hate it. And if we as a nation ever stood back and said, we're not going to get fooled. The old rules always apply. What matter is, matters is patient, constant return. What matters is coherent business strategies. What matters are the fundamentals. If we as a nation did that, I'm out of business. I don't have any more fraud to write about. I don't have any more books to tell. I can't tell any more John Grisham stories. And sadly, John Grisham's going to have to start getting his stories out of someplace other than the newspaper. Um, that, I believe, is the lesson of Enron. It doesn't exonerate them. It condemns them. But it also condemns us. And with that, I ask if there are any questions.